Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Venkat Kapil, and some of you may have seen me before. I gave uh, two lectures on machine learning potentials. And uh, today I will mainly be talking about a uh, first principle simulation, but let's say a more modern approach where we use machine learning potentials for uh, as surrogate models for the first potential energy landscape, but also that we overall combine it with more sophisticated sampling techniques, as well as use some higher end electronic structure methods uh, uh, to, to perform some comprehensive uh, studies. So I will mainly be talking about uh, like one example, which is the case of nanoscale confined water. But overall, uh, I will be discussing uh, things like how do you combine different approaches available in the armory of, a, a, let's say, a computational chemist. And also more from, for, let's say, a, a beginner PhD student, the entire, uh, the entire process of problem solving, you know, how do you select a problem? What should you make sure while asking the right questions, literature review, and so on. Right, so let's uh, get started. Uh, before I, uh, since it's a long thing, I just thought I would introduce myself in terms of where I actually come from. So I'm from India and uh, I come from the city called Allahabad, uh, which uh, is in the north central part of India. So it basically divides the country in two halves. So it's really at the center. So the time in Allahabad is actually the time in India, generally. And as you can see from this, it's actually, a place where two of the biggest rivers in India uh, unite, and that makes it a very religious place. And uh, there were some many interesting people. Actually, I didn't know Allahabad would be of interest to anyone until I found out that Irwin Schrodinger was actually, since he was interested in many other things, many things other than science too, he took the head of uh, department in, in physics in the University of Allahabad as well. And yeah, so interesting yeah at least for for me and after that i did my undergrad in the city close to my hometown at least on india standards of distances it's called kanpur it's the town is actually an industrial town it's it was the counterpart of manchester but in india so lots of industries but but the university is actually in a township and it's a very beautiful area with lots of green and so on so if anybody gets a chance i would recommend you to visit uh, the university of course for academic reasons and since then i did my phd in this beautiful town called lausanne in the group of michele Ceriotti, uh, where i really had a great uh, time uh, with the view of the alps as well from my from my office and since then i've uh, uh, been in cambridge uh, in this beautiful building called yusuf hamid department of chemistry as you can see one of the wonders of this city definitely yeah, so this is some something like my my geo line where I come from and where I am really right now, uh, and that's it about me. Uh, that's all that you need to know. And now we can talk about science. All right. So yeah, that was a smooth segue from uh, geology to uh, first principles methods. So I just want to have this slide to uh, discuss uh, the first principles that we actually use here and the word method, but in a more generic sense. So like how exactly, what exactly is going to be our guiding philosophy while, pro while doing problem solving, right? And generally in computational yeah. chemistry or computational material science, our goal is if you have a system, you know, on one hand and you have an observable, you would like to know how do you map the system completely to the observable, right? So any system that I give you, it could be a hybrid lead perovskite and the observable could be, let's say, a, it's thermal conductivity or it's electrical conductivity, right? So the question is, how do you go from here to here? And luckily we have been provided with two really nice theories. The first one is the theory of quantum mechanics uh, and the other one is uh, statistical mechanics. So how exactly do they help us? Well, uh, they try to break the problem in two. The first half of the problem really asks, what are the possible energy levels of the system, right? So in this case, it's a water molecule. So uh, the first step would be to understand what kind of states the system can really be in. And once you know all of these states, you can ask the question, sure, but if I'm doing my experiment at a given temperature or pressure, how many of these states actually uh, are accessible at those conditions? 
so by knowing all the states and by knowing the probability of each state you can actually map the original system to any observable because all you need to do is calculate that observable for those states so this is a very uh, generic way of uh, talking about mapping a system uh, and an observable where a state could mean any state it's actually your choice you could think in terms of positions or you could also think in terms of quantum states so that really is our first principles approach where we use a theory of quantum mechanics to say that well our system will be in so in in uh, these discrete states and then statistical mechanics will really allow us to know how the atoms are actually uh, how moving and which states are actually being occupied and so uh, alternatively uh, so this one is clearly a phenomenological approach where you have applied use some sort of physics here and any error in this physics would actually lead to an error in your observable right so this is the whole idea behind phenomenology that you think of a phenomena and you try to model your system with that right now recently there has been progress along another way of thinking more in practice though which is the purely inductive approach so you all have read principles of mathematical induction probably uh, earlier on and the idea here is to just uh, predict based on what you already know and in this case the way you can do things is if you know already a lot of systems and you have correspondingly a list of all your observables then in that case you can make this data sets and you can say well i already know that all of these systems map to this observable in a certain way so you could be looking at energies or you could be looking at rates of reactions and you say well based on what i know what can i tell about a new system right and this is where machine learning is one of these approaches which is purely inductive because uh it is based on a model which can learn anything so it doesn't have anything phenomenological or there is nothing special in this model for your problem so this model can really learn anything so the idea here is to make sure that you already know a fair bit and use that to make a prediction right so again i mean this slide is just to put things in perspective that uh, if you use a phenomenological approach what you have to be really careful with is the fact that your model has to be really good and if you use an inductive approach what you really have to be careful with is that you have enough prior knowledge to make a prediction and this is something that you should be careful while doing your simulations because a lot of times simulations are actually done in this manner where you predict part of your uh, problem with induction for example if you use a machine learning potential in that case you use some prior knowledge on the structures and energies and you use that to uh to get a potential energy surface uh and then after that you do your statistical mechanics generally rather rigorously you do your molecular dynamics or your harmonic approximation and so on right so we just need to know what could be the possible errors in our mapping by just knowing the kind of approaches that we do right now this was uh the first principles theory and the methodology uh in principle right so in practice things are usually quite different so most of you must have already started working on a project right and in these projects you probably have to calculate something or find an approach to calculate something and most of the time if you work in the first principles area then you really have to make many choices right so like which is the electronic structure method that you would have to choose like do you need to use a density functional or do you need to use something actually much simpler like a force field and even when you choose a density functional do you need to correct it somehow do you need to use let's say a van der waals correction to uh, incorporate a uh, dispersion or do you need to use this plus u correction for strong correlation and so on in other cases some of you might be using a uh, more expensive and sophisticated approaches like the random phase approximation mp2 or some of you might even be doing maybe quantum monte carlo and so on so depending on what problem you are trying to solve you may have to make this choice right mm -hmm. similarly uh, when you tr try to make a prediction at finite temperature and pressure you again have to make a choice how do you move your atoms do you assume that your atoms don't move maybe if you are looking at the binding energy of an atom on a surface that is actually sufficient uh, if you want to look at a crystal maybe you need to use a harmonic approximation to model its vibrations and if it is a liquid uh, then perhaps you also need to take into account the the fact that all these molecules can flow so you need to use molecular dynamics and if they are light atoms you may have to use path integral molecular dynamics right and finally once you have selected the way in which you will move your atoms and the way in which you will represent the energy between your atoms you will likely be calculating an observable which could be as simple as let's say an energy 
or as complicated as uh, the rate of a reaction. Right? But these are all the steps that you will likely have to do. And once you have your results, you will have to draw conclusions as well, whether these results actually make sense, do they agree with experiments or, or, or not, or do they make you understand something new, right? Now, these are the, the key steps that you will likely be using uh, based on, of course, your problems, but there are also some other things which are very important. And I, I personally feel these are more important than these four steps. Uh, and the first thing is really selecting your scientific problem. Uh, and here I'm really talking about uh, the, of course, when you join your PhD and so on, you will be provided a project. And generally these projects are broad, right? And somehow you have to invest some time and, this, and decide exactly which question you would you like to ask, right? And the way you decide this is by asking yourself, what are the types of questions that can be answered right now? And so really to be able to select a good problem uh, you also need to do something called literature review because a lot of work has already been done. Every one of us stands on the shoulder of giants, the previous researchers who have really spent a lot of effort, right? And once you have a good idea of what the state of the art is like and what are the limitations, you can actually select your problem. And once your problem is selected, you can actually do these four steps. And finally, once you have that, you again have to put your results back in perspective, right? Because you have done a literature review, you have analyzed how how, what are the frontiers of your field and so on. So you have to see the conclusions that you draw, how relevant they are and so on. So the scientific problem is, is a lot more about these four technical things, you know. And I hope that by the end of this talk, using the example of uh, this particular paper where we really had to ask a lot of questions and spend a lot of time here and also in these four steps uh, uh, where I, I hope that I can actually give you, let's say something to, or some something which use you can use as a guideline, you know, even for your for your research problems, right? Of course, during this time, I will also be talking a bit about the technicalities of these because uh, this is this is this is also going to be a scientific talk. But I would also like to focus a lot more on these aspects, which may not seem uh, as important, you know. So I will just give an example of how I started selecting this problem statement, and of course, generally everyone has a scientific interest or some scientific background, right? So for example, when I start, when I came to Cambridge, I had just done my PhD in Michele Ceriotti's research group. And his research group, people work on two things or used to work on two things, or now just one. The first thing is quantum nuclear effects, which is using the fact that like electrons, even nuclei are quantum particles. And the other one is machine learning, right? So my PhD really was on developing approaches for quantum statistical sampling. So how do you make sure these atoms actually have some zero point fluctuations or they delocalize in space and so on. And I implemented all of these in this code called IPI, right? And once I had finished my PhD, some of the problems that I found interesting were related to a crystal structure prediction. So what I really wanted to do and at that point was to combine all of these sampling approaches and particularly uh, in this case, what I had developed were some approaches for incorporating anharmonicity along with quantum nuclear effects. So if you have a potential energy surface, it would even allow you to let's say tunnel through the barriers with these kinds of approaches. And I thought I should apply this to a big problem like a crystal structure prediction problem because it's a rather delicate problem because most polymorphs of a crystal are very close to each other in energies. And that really is one of the big problems in the field, right? So this is where I was coming from, okay? Now, the next thing is, where I was going, right? So I was going to Cambridge and my host group was Angelos Michaelidis, uh, who was actually in UCL before. And their interest really is uh, water and ice and surfaces, right? So uh, since I was going to be there, it would have made sense for both of us to work on something which is of interest to each other, right? And if you just think about it, me coming from a structure prediction problem and Angelos working on water, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, let's try to predict the structures of water and ice, right? But actually that's not the problem that we went for. We in fact went for another problem, which is when you have water trapped between uh, surfaces or cavities, uh, what exactly, how exactly does water behave? And particularly this was of interest to Angelos because he has been working on interfaces for a while. And for me, this was interesting because it amounts to structure prediction in two dimensions because when you have two graphene sheets and you put water in between them uh, and you start asking questions like what exactly is the phase of water here or what are the possible arrangements 
then you can arrange atoms in two dimensions here rather than three dimensions which happens in ice so it was a rather intriguing problem for me to ask how will water molecules uh, form uh, crystalline forms uh, in two dimensions right all right so this is how we approached uh, to something in 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 between and generally i would say when you're selecting a scientific problem some of the questions that you could ask yourself or discuss with your supervisor are really being aware of what exactly are the frontiers of your research areas and what are the open challenges and this is something that you get learn slowly it's not like when you start your phd in your first year you already know what are all the open problems but this is something you can learn slowly and slowly and one of the ways to do that is by looking at uh, what experiment uh, what experiments are being performed in your research area and and the other thing that you should definitely try to uh, understand while looking at papers or while attending these talks are what exactly are the experimentalists trying to understand because interpretation of experiments generally is a big problem in our area right and one thing that simulations and calculations can do because they work at the scale of atoms is really explain how things are happening right or how atoms are moving how exactly are the mechanisms of the processes which happen right and finally once you have identified what they are trying to understand you can ask yourself well how can i help with that is there any property that i can predict is there any uh, particular phenomenon that i can simulate and so on so with these four steps you should be able to let's say select your scientific problem right and of course this is not easy because it comes only with experience you know yeah. and the way to gain this experience is by actually doing a good amount of literature are you really knowing how things are going in your research area you know and i mean this is a literature review is an umbrella term it can actually mean a lot of things because what exactly do you mean by your research area right so i mean there are many levels of this for example if you're working on a methodology like density functional theory maybe the literature there really is related to what exactly have people been doing you know in terms of maybe finding new functionals or trying to make them faster or trying to uh, improve their accuracy or trying to make sure that they work not just for ground state properties and so on right and that could be like let's say a technical research area where you may need to know wh what are the tools that are being used in your community then the other thing is the research problem like for instance uh, let's say some of you are working on thin films or ceramics or let's say solar cells right so in that case you may want to ask and read papers exactly what are you know your peers or let's say or scientists trying to answer here so maybe in solar cells they are trying to understand uh, which of these how how do you make sure that a hybrid perovskite solar cell can actually be stabilized at finite temperature right so that becomes a problem of your uh, that that becomes a, a question in your research problem right so it makes sense to know what exactly are these big issues you know uh, surrounding your uh, research area and finally you could also be asking in my discipline you know uh, which is, which in our case is like computational chemistry computational material science what are the big open questions you know so what are these uh things what what are these uh, challenges if you solve then that will really advance the field so i feel like all of these things are worth thinking about doesn't mean that you stop doing your research uh, from tomorrow and just start thinking about these things but slowly and slowly as you read more papers as you get closer and closer you know to the end of your phd you will hopefully get an understanding not just about the methodology that you use but also the bigger problems in your research area and you know in the subject of science so for that of course it's very useful to read papers and some of the the papers that i read during when i was in this transitional phase was this one called holy grails for computational organic and biochemistry so it's still not the holy grail of all of chemistry but uh, it did mention some of the milestones that happened in the area of simulations and as you can see most of these are related to uh, uh, how you calculate your potential energy sources but some of them are also related to how do you move your atoms for example free energy perturbation uh, back in the 50s uh, or the qm mm approach uh, and also car pinello md these were really approaches to make sure you are able to move your atoms you know in a very particular way and what this paper also talks about for instance are some of the open areas which hopefully will be solved in the next uh, 20 to 30 years so for example design of catalysts uh materials design and discovery uh, 
uh, crystal structure prediction, binding energies for drug design and so on, or uh, reaction design, something a lot of chemists would be after, right? So that already gives you an understanding of what are the big problems in chemistry. So in a, even when you're trying to solve, let's say, a more really? specific problems, you can ask yourself, how is this going to uh, factor in, in terms of the big picture, which is the bigger problems uh, in chemistry, which are likely going to solve many of the socioeconomic or uh, socio-technological problems, hopefully, right? So in my case, one of the things that I was acquainted with, and it was good to see this, is crystal structure prediction, right? So this is exactly where I was coming from. And by reading all of these, I decided, okay, I have developed uh, some approaches for quantum nuclear effects. Let's apply it to an open problem and let's try to do it for structure prediction, which is actually useful in a lot of research areas, right? All right, so that was my, uh, so, so that was basically what I you know, took away from this. Now getting to the research problem, which is crystal structure prediction, you can again ask yourself, what are the open questions in this area, right? Uh, and these are going to start getting slightly more and more technical. All right, so for example, the way I approach this was by reading the latest papers. In this area, you have these blind tests and it's good to read the reports that come out of that. They explain what are the major issues right now. But one of the papers that came, uh, which was written by some of the winners of uh, these blind tests, which is Marcus Neumann and Alexander Kachenko. And they came up with this very nice paper where they came up with a methodology to predict the right uh, relative stabilities of uh, polymorphs of crystals used in the latest blind test. And they've, and uh, of course their approach was also not perfect. So they also critiqued or suggested improvements in their techniques. And one of the things that I've highlighted here is the fact that uh, to predict your actual free energies between your phases, you know, uh, in that step, what they found was that uh, using path integral molecular dynamics or vibrational self-consistent field, these types of approaches could be useful because they also include contributions arising from let's say zero point energies or tunneling of atoms. So if your crystal has some delocalization, or if some functional group starts rotating because of some rotational zero point energy and so on, right? So for example, these are just examples of what kind of literature I re read to really understand the next approaches that I need to develop or the problems that I need to work on, right? Okay. And, uh, and after that, uh, of course, I mean, I was also moving into this direction of uh, working with Angelos Michaelides, right? So in that case, I also had to ask, what are these open areas in the in the area or in 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 what Angelos has been working on, which is water and ice, and one of the reviews which I found extremely helpful and interesting, uh, which that was about knowledge gaps in transport through single digit nanopores. So when you have uh, uh, fluids uh, flowing through uh, confined spaces, and here we are talking about uh, the cavities which are of the size of nanometers and so on. What are the open questions? What do we not understand? And this is a really nice paper where they describe all of these problems which are not understood. And it's actually a large number of problems here. And that was actually one of the things which drew me towards this area of confinement, which is that in the case of bulk, I feel a lot of things are well understood. And when experimentalists perform these experiments here, the uh, a lot of talk is mostly about getting accuracy and good agreement with experiments. But in this area, there was a genuine need to understand the theory, right? And especially one of the things which was highlighted, which I really liked and something which was related to what I could work on, right? Was on describing phase transitions in the narrowest of pores. So this right here that below four nanometer water structures uh, caused the Gibbs-Thompson equation to fail with freezing mm -hmm. points varying dramatically and changing non monotonically So I'll get to what this Gibbs-Thompson e equation is. But the point is that when you have water which is restricted in the length scale of, of a nanometer where we are really talking about a couple of molecules you know, along particular directions, there the phase uh, boundary can really change. And in which way? So for example, uh, this nano-confined water, you know, one way of really trying to understand the way in which your phase boundary could change is by looking at the phase boundaries of bulk water and by doing a thermodynamic correction and how its free energy could change. you know, And that's called the Gibbs-Thompson equation. And what it predicts is that the phase boundaries would move, uh, actually move towards lower temp, would move towards lower temperatures. So that's the trivial prediction by the Gibbs-Thompson equation, which is useful 
uh, when the scale of confinement is not down to the scale of a few bunch of atoms, right? So now, when you're really at that scale, and we are really talking about a water molecules being trapped in biological systems, let's say a pore, you must have heard of aquapore in the one of the very popular uh, biosystems, you know, for water and ion transport. So the question is, how is that water different from the water that we see around us? And similarly, water trapped between rocks. So you know that concrete also contains traces of water, right? So you could ask yourself when water flows over here, which part of the phase diagram are we really talking about there? Are, can these properties really be mapped to the phase diagram of water at a different thermodynamic condition in terms of bulk? Or when water is trapped in concrete, uh, where it's very much a solid like phase, you could ask yourself, uh, which ice phase could it potentially form, right? So these were open questions uh, in this area. Now it's not just important to understand and uh, uh, just to understand the behavior of water, but also to think in terms of technology where uh, aqueous ions are used in, uh, let's say an ion exchange membrane uh, in a fuel cell, you know, to generate electricity and generating this from water is going to be great because it's one of the cleanest fuels, right? And even in this case, we don't really understand exactly how water flows through these membranes. In fact, when water is in contact with your uh, platinum catalyst, it is also unclear what exactly is the phase of water, you know, because it's really, things are really happening at the nanoscale. And finally, another example here is graphene being used for water filtration. Of course, this is more of a model system which has been used in this video. But yes, I mean, we still use nanoporous carbon for uh, for filtering water right now, right? And in future, maybe to make this process more effective, you know, and more, uh, let's say more, uh, to, to, to make it more, uh, uh, I'm out of words now, but let's say you don't want, you know, things other than water to go into your glass of uh, water, right? So to make this process much more efficient, uh, you may want to use something more specific here, right? So in this case, again, graphene comes to your rescue. Now, if you look at the literature on nanoscale water, there have been a handful of experiments and all of them indicate that it behaves rather strangely. For instance, if you look at phase transitions of water in carbon nanotubes, and again, it's a complicated figure, don't worry about it. This, is, this shows the Raman spectrum peak of uh, phase as a function of temperature. This gives you a sense of what exactly is the boiling point of water. And here you can see that when your diameter is of the order of one nanometer, your melting point here can be around 400 Kelvin, which is greater than the boiling point of water, right? So already you start seeing that in carbon nanotubes, water can actually display very high melting temperature. So it has a tendency to form solids is one of the conclusions you can draw from this paper, right? Now, Another paper also looks at the dielectric constant of water because we know that many of the properties of water as a solvent come from its high dielectric constant, right? So it has a very high constant of around 80 in bulk, but as soon as you start placing water between two hydrophobic sheets, this dramatically reduces. And close to this, again, this one nanometer mark, uh, you see that uh, water molecules display uh, a dielectric constant, which is almost equal to its optical dielectric constant. And what this suggests is that water molecules have stopped rotating, you know, yeah. and that is not leading to any dielectric response. Everything that you're getting is from its electronic state here. Yeah. And again, that indicates that maybe what you have yeah. is not really a liquid phase of water, right? So even though the question here is on dielectric constant, it, it makes you think in terms of what is the phase of water that we are probing, right? And another very nice uh, result uh, of some experiments which measure how water flows through these tubes made up of uh, carbon and HBN that they found that actually water flows extremely fast. You can calculate the friction coefficient of water. And as you reduce the radius of the tube, you know, you see that water really starts, uh, uh, starts flowing extremely fast over here. So again, all of these things make you wonder how exactly uh, is the phase uh, behavior of water changing, you know, as you confine it to narrow pores and cavities. And at least from my perspective, given also my background, which was from structural prediction and so on, I was rather interested in 
asking these questions what is the phase diagram of water because once you know the phases maybe you can answer other questions as well so of course i mean it's a difficult problem here you know uh, so you really have to break it down into sub problems and for that what you really have to do is again go back to what people have done you know and then try to see if you can draw any conclusions on what is the state of uh, simulations or the tech or, or the tools that we're going to use for this particular problem and at that point it makes sense to simplify things rather than complicate because there is a lot of literature so in my case what i really focused on was the thinnest possible sheet of water so a mono layer of water so just one molecule thick between two sheets of graphene uh, why because i mean since it's the simplest possible system any deviation from the uh, from from another result could be mapped to other things so you have reduced the number of parameters that can change across two systems right and the other thing is that this is also experimentally uh, probable so again it makes sure that if you make any prediction you know that can be measured and that's all, always a nice thing so the way people have been studying this system is by actually not explicitly including carbon atoms you know so the way they do things is by looking at a uh, water in 2d so this is just the side view so in the plane sorry in the plane that goes into the screen uh, is a 2d plane of water right and then the water carbon interactions they are uh, modeled generally using a field and this field could be as simple as a mohr's potential you know but uh, so this is exactly what we use so the only thing that changes across different studies uh, the property of the system is how you actually model the water water interactions right all right so this is what we decided to do which is instead of studying this complicated uh, monolayer of water we remove all the graphene sheets and just use a repulsive hydrophobic potential and then any deviation in different studies could be mapped directly to the potential energy surface of the water between the water molecules because the water carbon interactions are exactly the same right and what we really found out was that there was not much consensus from simulations so if we look at some force field simulations for example yeah. uh, which have yeah. i mean there are a lot of models for uh, for water you know like the entire tip np family so for example this uh, very interesting paper found that actually uh, de depending on what is the density of a monolayer of water uh, you could have two types of phases a hexagonal phase and this rhombic phase uh and then the more interesting bit was that after a certain point there is a continuous phase transition between the rhombic phase and the liquid phase right so of course for the hexagonal phase they observed a first order phase transition but for the rhombic phase they observed a continuous phase transition which is extremely interesting because no material in bulk can undergo a continuous phase transition while melting that just doesn't exist you know so it, it tells us that something interesting could be happening in nanoscale water however if you look at another force field for example this is the mw model uh, uh, and this is it has a three body com component to the model while uh, this only has pair wise interactions between water molecules and there they started observing more interesting phases uh, this is for example a pentagonal phase of of water yeah. so and then they find something where you have some twisted pen pentagons uh, and hex hexagons and of course some disordered phases as as well so changing the force field again takes you from a simple phase diagram to something which is much more complicated and the paper that i really liked there was one which analyzed a lot of models simultaneously for exactly the same uh for exactly the same conditions and in this case they looked at one gpa pressure you know for all of these models and you can see they show that the melting temperature for different models can actually change a fair bit you know depending on which model you choose and one of the plots that i really liked from this paper really was this which shows how does your energy change as you increase your temperature yeah. and interestingly you can see that in so in some cases there is an abrupt change uh, in your energy while in some cases you know you have a continuous change in your energy and curiously this paper had used a tip 5p water model you know and they again observed a continuous phase transition but a change in the potential leads to a first order mm -hmm. phase transition right so again that shows that actually for any scientific problem um, modeling your potential energy surface is one of the most fundamental things because 
whatever dynamics you perform on top of that that's not an independent effect you know that really is dependent completely on what kind of potential energy surface that you use so one really has to ask the question what exactly is the correct potential energy surface amongst all of these right right and the way to do that is by instead of using a force field is to use something like density functional theory which is at least a uh, first principles right and it was not fitted to uh, experimental data at least some of them uh, so in this case there is this nice paper by g chen from angelos michaelides group from uh, at least of uh, uh seven years ago maybe yeah and they found that using a particular functional uh they have hexagonal phase which can be degenerate compared to the pentagonal phase but after uh 0.02 gpa you have a pentagonal phase and you have then a square phase and note that this was all performed at zero kelvin because of course density functional theory calculations mm -hmm. are uh, rather expensive or at least back back then they were considered more expensive compared to the resources that were present right but the problem is that even density functional theory has some errors right because uh, you generally have to choose the dispersion uh, correction that you would use or the exchange correlation functional now in this case because the interaction between water structures is, uh, or the difference in energies is so uh, small again the crystal structure prediction problem uh, depending on which functional you use you can get a different phase for example another paper which came during the same time uh, compares the square phase with the hexagonal phase and they find that at all pressures negative to positive uh, the square phase is always more uh, stable than the hexagonal phase so what they found was that only one phase survives now you can again ask the question the only difference between these two is the density functional so which of these functional is actually giving you the right result right so again i mean the choice of your interactions is of is of paramount uh, is, is 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 paramount actually and just to summarize everything uh, the empirical force fields which were generally performed at finite temperatures uh, they showed that the results depended on the water models uh, the actual phases that you would see uh, the order of the phase transitions as well as the melting temperatures right while in case of density functions which were done at zero kelvin mostly Uh, the results were dependent on the exchange correlation functional and some of them would give you a large number of phases while others would only uh, predict mm -hmm. one phase to be more stable and of course the absence of dynamical simulations will also mm -hmm. makes it dif difficult for us to compare directly the results from dft and empirical mm -hmm. force fields right so this was really the literature review that i had done you know during my time and it and to be very honest it took me two months to decide exactly what i would like to work on because there was so much literature to read and finally after two months where i had the awareness of what is the state of research in our area on this topic i could actually choose uh, i could come up with a sound uh, scientific strategy to compute the phase diagram and what i could really understand based on the literature was that there are four types of uh, problems that you have you know and the first one is really the water water and water cavity interactions particularly if you don't mm -hmm. model this right then you can get dramatically different results as we had seen in literature right the other thing which i noticed was that force fields calculations do finite temperature phase diagrams while uh, density functional calculations are at zero kelvin so it's really the cost which determines you know mm -hmm. what is the level at which you will compute your phase diagram it could be either be at zero kelvin if it's too expensive or finite temperature so one of the things is really to find a balance between accuracy and cost so that you can actually reduce the overall amount of errors in your modeling right and the third thing was based on again uh, these uh, based on again uh, these uh, the literature review is the possible phases of ice are different right in for example one thing i didn't tell you was that force fields are not able to generally stabilize uh, like all the tip np models are not able to stabilize the pentagonal phase and they generally lead to phases with four fold symmetry rather than six fold symmetry so that makes us ask a question like are we really making sure that we sample all possible phases of ice with our model right and finally the last thing is that we need to know the melting temperatures we need to know what is the order of phase transition we need to know exactly at what temperatures and pressures these transitions change so that we can make a comparison with bulk and if we have an experiment and we know what temperature and pressure that has been performed at you know we can really uh, 
we, we can really uh, ask some questions as to how we can compare our results with the experimental results, right? And so this is basically where my uh, literature review uh, finished here, yeah. and that allowed me to think about how I would approach this problem. And yeah, at this point, I think it's a good time to stop for a little bit. And maybe if anybody has any question, you know, you can just feel free to ask me. I have a question. Please. Yeah. Could you go back to where you're explaining the uh, carbon free method of the water confinement? Oh, which method, please? Sorry. Where you remove the carbons and you were saying right. that you. Yeah, that one, that one. Do you yeah. have that as a, um, I wouldn't call it homogeneous, but is it everywhere the same or do you keep it in the same, like those hydrophobic right? yeah. in the structure of graphene or not? Right, no, actually it doesn't know what exactly is the symmetry of graphene. It's purely uniform in the X and Y directions okay. or in the plane of confinement. So that's the simple model that is being used here and also the model which has been used in literature. you know, And of course, what was done before was also a driving force to decide what we will do, because if we had done this directly for water in graphene sheets with explicit carbon, and we found a difference, it would be hard for us to know whether that difference comes from the potential energy surface or from the fact that we are including carbons. Right? Have people done this with the uh, localized potential? Uh, what do you mean by a localized potential? So instead of having the homogeneous potential, yeah. um, having more localized plate in oh. the form of carbon atoms. Like yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think the way it has been done is by using a sheet of carbon and fixing all the atoms. So in, in turn, it amounts to the same, you know, and that has yeah. been done as well. Yes. All right. Thanks for the question. Do we have any other question, you know, particularly from... Uh, PhD students uh, in the early years, the online folks. Nope. All right. Uh, one quick one for me. <laughs> um, you said you looked at different, um, like the, about the process of, thinking of doing literature review. What did you find to be the, the uh, best way of going about finding sources that give you a good overview of the whole um, yeah. field? Is it just reviews or are there like seeding papers out there? Yeah, I think, as you said, the re reviews here are really the best way to understand what's going on in the field. And you, at that point, really hope that the reviewers have, the people who wrote the review have done a job, good job of, you know, uh, uniformly looking at what everyone has been doing. And generally, uh, in most fields, you have multiple reviews, you know, by different sets of authors. You know? So that is particular, that is quite useful. And once you have the reviews, you have certain papers to follow, you know, so that that's and that gives you let's say a route to more detailed information the other way to do that is by looking at let's say some landmark papers the most cited papers in your area you know and uh, reading them and then also trying to see which papers have cited them so which other papers are based on that you know so that again gives you a route uh, towards understanding what all has been made possible due to this paper you know so these are the two things. And the third thing I would say, it always makes sense to read reviews from different parts of the world because somehow there is this intrinsic tendency uh, for us to uh, cite, or maybe not, maybe I should, uh, at least I have also observed this in myself that you end up only citing papers or people that you know about or who are, you know, or you may have heard about, but actually a lot of research is being done. So if you look at, uh, these reviews from different parts of the world, you'll see that a lot of people have actually done similar things, you know. And by reading these, you get to really understand the, let's say, a more global landscape of research going on rather than uh, something which is happening just, let's say, in the UK academic community or, let's say, the French academic community. So that these are the things that I found 
I have found useful. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so no other question so far? Okay, let's move on then. All right, so the first bit that I'm going to talk about now where we are going to get into some of the technicalities, again, gently, uh, are going to be, uh, how do you get your water-water interactions right? You know, And again, I mean to make sure that we are all on the same page. We have not considered any carbon or you know confining material explicitly. So the entire potential can be broken down into the interaction between uh, molecules and the surface and the molecule-molecule uh, level interaction. Okay, so in your density functional theory courses, uh, you have learned about this, uh, or your electronic structure courses, about the so-called Jacob's Ladder, which qualitatively describes, you know, the different levels of theory, you know, which on average give you uh, different accuracy. So, of course, there is no hard and fast rule. I mean, LDA can be extremely good for something like carbon, you know, but overall, if you, let's say, have a set of molecules of diverse origins, you would see that generally the more physics you add here, the better results you get. And on top, you have this so-called chemical heaven, which is the kind of accuracy that you would get if you really manage to solve this at the highest level of theory. And there are many approaches there, but the two approaches, at least, that I am more acquainted with uh, are uh, quantum Monte Carlo and a truncated version of coupled cluster, you know, uh, because at least based on the people I have worked with and so on, these have really been shown to also practically give you numbers that you can compare, you know. For example, uh, of course, I mean, for bulk system, it is extremely hard to get uh, because these are also, maybe I didn't mention this, but as you go higher along, along this ladder with accuracy, the cost also increases, right? So you have to pay some price in terms of your computational budget here. So many methods have really been developed which can give you these numbers. And one of these methods is something like, a, it's called an embedding procedure uh, called quantum mechanical embedding. And the idea really is that if you have a system, uh, you can actually say that, well, if you want to explore a small part of your system, you know, in that case, you can build a cluster around that central uh, atom or central region. You can treat that with, a, with your uh, favorite quantum chemistry method. And you can treat the rest at a more approximate level. So this is more in along the lines of a QMMM type approach being applied to material science. And this really allows you to get a couple cluster estimates, which are generally used for gas phase systems. You can use it on a bulk system as well. The other approach that has been, that I have been more acquainted with is quantum Monte Carlo, and especially the implementation uh, by uh, Andrea Zen. Uh, which was an earlier paper act actually, but in this paper, what they really showed was that for molecular systems, uh, diverse sets, so for example, uh, water-based systems, which are particularly stabilized by hydrogen bonds up to uh, dispersion interaction systems uh, dominated by dispersion interactions, they showed that QMC was consistently giving uh, uh, results in good agreement with experiments. Uh, and of course, it's not the only method, for example, for systems which uh, do not have a band gap uh, mp2 actually has a gives gives a very good description as as well and of course for cases where you can do a fully periodic couple cluster calculation you also see that that generally also lies within this so called chemical accuracy you know uh, and the reason why i'm talking about these approaches is that generally it is not possible for us to know what is the best potential energy surface you know because all of these are based on certain approximations in many cases, these are uncontrolled approximations. So they cannot be systematically improved. So it always makes sense to have some sort of a reference to compare with. And this reference, if possible, can be an experiment. But there are many cases where experiments are either not possible or very hard to do. And in those cases, one can do quantum Monte Carlo calculations or truncated couple cluster and get something as a substitute to experiment. Right? Particularly in our case, where we did not have uh, experimental data, uh, this is something, uh, so with Andrea Zen, we performed we, uh, these quantum Monte Carlo calculations at zero GPA and at two GPA for some of the previously known phases, you know. And at the end of the day, we just had a bunch of numbers, you know. 
of relative stabilities of the hexagonal, pentagonal, rhombic, and square phases at two different pressures. And with these seven numbers, we had seven data points, you know. And with this, we were able to really compare the corresponding energies from a lot of density functionals, you know. So, for example, this is a plot where we have, uh, where, which where we, so a similar analysis was done earlier, but not with all the functionals. So we redid this with the latest QMC data as well. And uh, the vertical lines here give you an estimate of uh, the energy with respect to a hexagonal phase, you know, or the enthalpy with respect to a hexagonal phase. And for example, the black line will always be zero because that corresponds to the hexagonal phase. The red line is the energy of the pentagonal phase, which is a few MeVs. The magenta one is for the square phase and the green one is for the rhombic phase, right? So with this, by plotting it in this manner, any deviation uh, between the line and the point of a given color tells you what is the error in that density functional, you know? Uh, and you can see that uh, there are many functionals which actually do not work really well, but as soon as you include a van der Waals interaction, you know, or a van der Waals correction, you start seeing a uh, rather good numbers, you know, or a better agreement between uh, your density functionals uh, with, uh, with with the quantum Monte Carlo data. This is just to sh say that uh, this is not something that we found out. I mean, it was already known before that in a lot of cases, uh, for, particularly for molecular crystals uh, 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 and especially water, including van der Waals actually corrects uh, for many of the errors in these functionals. And by looking at all of these errors, we eventually decided to pick this particular functional, which is ref PBE zero plus V3. Uh, and you might ask why this, why not, you know, some other function like even B3 lip D3 works really well or the ref PBE D3, which is cheaper than the hybrid, you know, that also seems to be really good, you know. So why did we choose this particular more expensive functional? And again, the idea lies in uh, knowing the research hemisphere, you know, what's going on in your field. So in the case of bulk water, there was this very nice paper by Tom Markland and Andre Marcelik, where they computed the vibrational spectra of water uh, with and without quantum nuclear effects, you know. And what they found out was that if you do things considering that the nuclei are classical, so their dynamics is purely classical Newtonian, uh, you actually get a really good ex good agreement uh, of the, your vibrational spectrum with the experiment, you know. But as soon as you include quantum nuclear effects, uh, you start seeing a red shift. So uh, th the blue and green lines are with quantum nuclear effects, and uh, the red one is uh, the is uh, is a classical simulation. So you see that actually for ref PBE D3, the non-hybrid, uh, the classical simulation is in very good agreement with experiments. While as soon as you include quantum nuclear effects, it gets worse. On the other hand, if you have a hybrid functional, your uh, classical simulation actually gives a poor agreement with experiment. But as soon as you include quantum nuclear effects, so as soon as you make your modeling more accurate, you start seeing a good agreement with the experiment. Now, if you were to analyze uh, this particular plot in just in terms of the frequency of the stretching mode, and if you had you know, uh, some experience in interpreting spectra of water, what you can infer here is how is the anharmonicity of the OH bond. You know, we all have heard about the Morse potential, right? So, if you have a Morse potential, then as you increase the anharmonicity, you see a red shift in your vibrational spectra. What that really shows here is that at the classical level, when you are not really sampling very uh, severely along your OH bond, uh, you have a frequency which is larger, which means that you are not probing the anharmonic regions here. While as soon as you include quantum nuclear effects where you have a zero point uh, energy, which makes sure that you really start probing the anharmonic regions, you see that you have a good agreement with the experiment. So that shows that uh, even though in this case, uh, your ref PBE functional and ref PBE zero give you pretty much similar relative energies, far from the equilibrium condition, you know, ref PBE D3 can over dissociate water because it enhances the anharmonicity of your system. While ref PBE zero D3 gives a better description of the anharmonicity along the OH bond. So again, I mean, life is not perfect. Uh, we did not have <laughs> any way to perform QMC on nano confined water. But in the case of bulk water, there are experiments available and we can use whatever knowledge we have. So by combining the prior knowledge on bulk 
uh, and by using some quantum Monte Carlo calculations on nanoscale water, we were able to make an informed choice on the right functional. And later on, when I show the results, you will see that this particular choice of not going with FPBE was actually very useful. All right. Does anybody have any question on this part? Because uh, next will be uh, on how do you compute this efficiently? Yep, please feel free to ask, you know, don't feel shy. Okay. All right, I mean, I think that's a cue to move on, you know. So once we have all of these interactions, having identified a density functional, it is good to ask, how do we make sure we can calculate these uh, efficiently? Because of course, even before us, people were able to perform calculations at DFT level, right? So the key thing was really that it's still too expensive to perform a, a full exploration of the phase diagram at finite thermodynamic conditions, right? And so we wanted to make sure that we can fit, you know, a model, you know, to refv 0 D3 data. And again, related to what I have discussed in my previous lectures here, is that the actual force fields that you use, if you look at, go back in time and see when the first force fields were done, they were all phenomenological models, you know, like what people really thought, what should be an interaction between uh, the bonded terms? And that came out to be a harmonic interaction. Same with the angle. For the torsions, they realized it has to be something like this, you know. And with that, they were able to come up with this kind of a model for biomolecular system. But if you look at something else like uh, an embedded atom model, which is generally used for ionic systems or uh, purely atomic systems, where you don't really have the same types of bonds as you have in chemical system, you will see that you have a pair potential, you know, but you also have this nonlinear function F acting on the density of all the atoms surrounding a particular atom. So it's called an embedded atom model, where you're really saying is that uh, the total energy is the sum of all the energies of atoms, and each atom is embedded in this field, and this field actually depends on all my neighbors of this atom. So the total energy is dependent on pairwise interactions, as well as the environment in which an atom is uh, is embedded in, and which is given by this complicated function. function. And here you really work with uh, non-physical functions, you know, and they were shown to give good results. And if we move to, let's say, a reactive system, and this is the example of the reacts FF force field, you will see that it depends on a lot of these terms, but each of these terms depends on the bond order now. And the bond order, again, is something which depends on the arrangement of all the other atoms around a given atom. You know, So you can start seeing that as you move to more complicated systems, instead of just looking at pairwise or nearest neighbors, you have to include the fact that there are many other atoms that could potentially be around one atom. And the energy of your system actually depends on all of these local environments, you know. And fast forward uh, many, many years from 1983, and you have some breakthroughs in this area by uh, Jörg Beller and Michele Painello initially, and of course, Albert Bartok and Gabor Chani, uh, where they came up with this, uh, with this approach for machine learning, the mapping between your structure and the energy. And the idea here, here really is the same as before that, any way we are going towards more complicated models, why not go for, why be restricted with these functional forms? Why not go for a universal approximator, you know, a function which can actually learn any uh, amount of data, which can learn any function in principle, as long as you provide it with the data. And of course, generally you don't do it in a brute force way, you do it in a much smarter way. And that smarter way is that you don't train directly on the positions, but you work in this, uh, with these chemical environments, you say that for every atom, instead of providing it with X, Y, and Z uh, coordinates, I will describe it with its chemical environments. And these environments are defined by these so-called symmetry functions, which kind of probe the number of atoms, you know, along particular directions at a given distance, you know. So radial symmetry functions only probe, let's say the number of atoms up to a particular distance. These kinds of symmetry functions probe the number of atoms around a central atom, which are around, let's say, this particular value, while there are also these angular symmetry functions, which also tell you how many atoms are there at a given angle and so on. 
And once you replace your coordinates with these abstract chemical environment functions, you can use something which is very similar to an embedded atom model, you know, where you have, uh, instead of defining your chemical environment with all the distances and a nonlinear function here, you say that I'm going to use symmetry functions and this F again becomes your neural network. So it's actually extremely similar. So again, just to give another, just to make another point that even back then people were still standing on the shoulder of giants, you know, looking at what literature had already done and building, you know, models based on what other people had done and sort of just going at it from scratch and so on, right? And yeah, so that's really how it works. This is basically an embedded atom model where you predict yeah. atomic energies and the energy of each atom in your water molecule now will depend on the chemical environment. And this chemical environment is probed by the positions of all the other atoms. So it's a generic nonlinear function of all the other atoms which are around this particular atom. You know. uh, and if you're looking at the codes that can do these things, there are many of them. The one that I use particularly is N2P2, which implements this uh, seminal work by Jörg Beller and Michele Painello. Of course, I mean, nowadays there are as many uh, machine learning models uh, as as uh, the number of people uh, attending this talk, which initially I thought uh, would be a better joke if there were more people, you know. But uh, yes, yeah, so, but the point is that there's quite a few of these implementations available. Uh, my mm -hmm. suggestion is to go for the most well-known and robust implementations, you know, which is something the implementations that other people have worked on, unless there is a specialized thing that you would like to use with a particular machine learning model, you know, because otherwise you can really start spending time. All of these codes are written by uh, chemists, physicists, or material scientists, you know, so that could have a lot of errors as well, you know, which you may not be aware of. And if you start using a new code, you may be one, you may be the one finding these errors. So just a line of caution over there. All right, so with a machine learning model, this is where we discuss the actual model which fits the things, but you need some training data, right? And there are many ways of uh, generating your training data. There is no rule. In some cases, you can even find data sets online, you know? In other cases, you have to curate your own data set depending on the problem, you know? So in my case, for example, I had already worked with molecular crystals because that was where I was coming from, right? With crystal structure prediction and so on. And in these cases, again, I used some prior knowledge based on what other scientists had done, which is like uh, this very uh, important paper by, uh, by Garrett uh, Brandenburg, where they showed that even a model like density functional tight binding, which we would think is not very good, as soon as you add dispersion corrections to it, uh, it leads to a dramatic increase in, uh, in its ac accuracy. And of course, this is, the errors are still very high for any structure prediction calculation, but it shows that uh, at least qualitatively, these models are correct, you know, and they are actually, they can be used as surrogate models. If you don't want to perform a much more expensive DFT calculations, you can definitely use this particular parameterization of DFTB with dispersion just to have some qualitative insights about your systems. So in this paper, what we really did was that we used DFTB and performed a large number of path integral and MD calculations for all of these polymorphs, giving us a huge data set you know, of structures. And with that pool of data sets, we were able to select using some data-driven strategies, not important, the most important thousand uh, points. You know, and on those thousand points, we're able to do DFT calculations. So thereby using a much cheaper model where we could use, uh, where, where we could use uh, molecular dynamics and path integral MD at a cheap cost, we were able to thoroughly sample the configurational space of interest for all of these molecular crystals, right? And that allowed us to just get 1000 really distinct points on which we could perform our DFT calculations. Uh, that was one way, and we, and this way was very effective for us because we were only interested in uh, particular uh, free energies at a given thermodynamic condition, and we could simulate with DFTB at that condition uh, to get our data. But in certain cases, for example, in this case, what I was interested in was uh, an entire phase diagram, so an ensemble of temperatures and an ensemble of pressures, right? right? So in those cases, you can ask yourself, how exactly can you generate data? I mean. Of course, you could do this do this thing as well. You could use DFTB, you know, 
and try to get as much data as you can, you know, across a lot of temperatures and pressures. But there exists a more uh, sophisticated approach. And this is something I also worked on during the last year of my PhD. Uh, and in this case, we implemented, uh, at least in this code called IPI, uh, which links uh, electronic structure and uh, machine learning codes uh, uh, with MD uh, uh, functions. We, pre we Im Im implemented a so-called committee model and in a committee model, instead of using one potential energy surface, you can use many instances of your potential energy surface and average all of them. So the idea is that if you have your reference training data, you know, you can divide it into many smaller training sets. For each of these training sets, you can train a new model, you know, and all of these models are going to be, uh, let's say, instances of a predict will give you instances of a prediction, right? And with these models, if you compute their average, that gives you your final prediction. If you compute their disagreement, that gives you an error. You know, so you can use this error in many in many ways. You know, you can use this error for putting explicit error bars on your observables. So if you want to know exactly how much error is caused in your radial distribution function due to your machine learning potential, then you can actually see them here. It's not small. You know, let me tell you that. But you can also use this committee for other things. For example, you can use this committee to make sure that you drive your molecular MD simulation in the direction where these errors are high. Thereby you can automatically sample configurations where these, uh, where the model has higher errors and keep adding that uh, to your training set and keep repeating this process iteratively. So this is called an active learning scheme. And uh, when I arrived in Angelos's group, uh, Christoph Schran was also one of the people there who had implemented this uh, scheme and applied it already to some aqua system. So I use basically his implementation. And together what we were able to do was starting with a model which was trained on bulk by just subsequently adding more and more data points, we were able to build a model uh, for nanoscale water. So basically we started with an earlier bulk model which had liquid interface uh, ice uh, and high pressure ice uh, phases. Uh, and we were able to already perform uh, some preliminary uh, simulations of monolayer water with that. And the output of these, uh, of, and with the new data generated by running these simulations, we were able to subselect more points. And all of these points were the ones with the highest uh, machine learning errors, which meant that the model did not know about these points. And they were able to add a bit more of these. Then, and finally, we were able to retrain the model. Uh, and in this case, we were able to do uh, temperature ramps, pressure ramps, monolayer, bilayer phases, as well as high pressure, liquid water and ice phases to make sure that our model is, is solid in the end. So by, in this case, using three steps, we were able to get a model, which was initially trained on bulk and get it to work for a monolayer of water. Right? Uh, and of course, the nice bit is that since you predict errors, you get your you can predict what exactly is the error at every temperature and pressure by running simulations at these. And overall, we could see that all the errors were smaller than what we had anticipated. Uh, and of course, these are much smaller than what would actually cause problems in our MD. So by seeing a plot like this, we were all very happy that, okay, in two weeks, we have really gone from a bulk-like model to a model which works on nanoscale water. And, uh, we are also able to know exactly what kind of errors you would potentially make at different uh, points. Uh, so do we have any questions at this point? Yeah, that sounds like I should move on, but of course, I mean, please don't feel shy. Uh, it would be uh, useful like if we, have, let's say, not a monologue, but a dialogue. Yeah. All right, so in any case, it has been almost one hour. Maybe it's a good time to take a few minutes of break, you know, and then I can return and I can do the rest of the slides. Yeah. So let's okay. take a break of a few minutes, yeah.
Mm-hmm. All right. So at least I am ready to continue now. But have any? Has anybody left in that room, or should I wait for a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, take your time. I'm happy to wait for a bit longer as well. All right. Uh, so, is everybody back in the room, or is it not yet? All right. Yeah. Right. Actually, as I said, there is no rush. In... So just maybe write in chat as soon as people are ready. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. Awesome. Recording as well. No, I think that's. But okay. you okay with that? Okay. <laughs> I'm okay with that as long as. Uh, as long as, yeah. I mean, you you are free to pause it and you know start it once again if you like. One question I have right now is, um, so you said the two weeks going from test set to validation. Uh, I mean, that, that that does sound very short. How long would you say is the normal time people usually have taken for that? I feel like nowadays the time is getting shorter and shorter, you know, um, because uh, I think early on it would take an entire PhD to, you know, make a potential. But those were early days of these potential, right? And I would say now, at least for a given, if you just want to co- work on a particular uh, temperature or pressure that you can even do if you have your training set, these models are good enough that you can just use them out, out of the box. So in a couple of days, you know, and the bigger problem uh, with models which work globally, you know, is really uh, the sampling strategy that generally it is hard to make sure that you know exactly what data to add. You know? And in those cases, if you have an idea, you know, like if you know a surrogate model, which is decent enough mm-hmm. and you start with, you know, a big pool of data, of data points, then I think it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, Generally, the problem is that the 
uh, the turnover time of training these models is long enough. You know, people make silly mistakes while, uh, and many of these are because uh, the documentation is poor or you need some tricks, you know. Yeah. But I think if you have a good enough strategy and if you know, let's say an expert who can help you out navigate through these some of these trick trickeries and black magic then it's rather straightforward you know and, i would uh, you, you said so this kind of estimation of your errors that you did by using the the, the sap world this community, community yeah. yeah um is that something people have, is like kind of standard practice nowadays to kind of see what what are your errors yeah i think that is slowly you know becoming the standard now at least if you use i think n2p2 may or may have this option but uh, at least i know that it is in the pipeline you know so and the gap potential also has some options for that for uncertainty so yeah it's certainly becoming uh, becoming the standard uh, the other thing i would say is that certain codes allow you to combine multiple potentials you know for example mm -hmm. the one code that i use which is ipy uh, uh, is one where you don't have to implement this separately. You can just run n models, you know, and average them within the code. Uh, but it is always useful if your machine learning code can do that, you know, because then it's yeah. optimized for that. Mm. Right. All of most of that code is written in Python, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat that? What is, what is the what is the the most uh, the language that is mostly used in that code? Python. Uh, yeah, so, I mean uh, nowadays yeah. most most of the codes are becoming Pythonic because they are now people are starting to use uh, PyTorch for implementing these. But early codes were, you know, C plus plus C or uh, Fortran actually. Also because it is always useful to implement this in LAMPS because LAMPS has a really uh, efficient neighbor list calculator and domain decomposition. So, uh, so if you want to do that, you have to implement it in in uh, either implement it in uh, C plus plus, or you need to let's say work with a static object which can talk to C plus plus. So, yeah. I think the the modern way is to maybe work like that that you have something in Python but with bindings which allow you mm -hmm. to also connect it with a C++ code. Yeah. All right. Ready now. All right, so yes. So yeah, I think that break was probably needed. You know? uh, and now let's move forward. Uh, so yeah, so some of the challenges that I discussed, which were again, an outcome of some thorough literature review, which were understanding water-water interactions. Uh, then computing the total energy and forces efficiently. And the third one really was making sure that we know all possible phases of ice, which are relevant in our case. And in this particular, yeah. You, are you trying to share your screen right now? Or because we're receiving your view, not the. Oh, I am so sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So luckily I had not gone to the next slide. Uh, yeah. So the next bit that we would really like to make sure is we know all the possible phases of ice which are of relevance. You know, we don't miss them out somehow. And this is actually a rather difficult problem. Uh, and I think next week Chris Picard is going to talk about uh, random structure search and structure prediction. And maybe I'll just share one slide on that uh, just to highlight this problem, which is one of his papers. Uh, and in this case, it's a 2D uh, scatter plot, you know, where this is essentially a dimensionality reduction or a clustering of structures. You know? So the distance between two points depicts how similar they are, and they are colored according to the energies with respect to a particular structure. You know? uh, and I think it's energy with respect to probably the hexagonal phase uh, in this case. And you can see that if we just consider a 10 Kelvin difference of energies, you know. All of these structures that you can see here, you know, uh, all of these structures uh, are within 10 Kelvin of each other, you know, and some of these are weird, you know. I mean, they don't look like the kind of ice phases that that you would find, you know, uh, or, or that you find naturally. But it just shows that 
the many different ways in which water molecules can pack in a 3D lattice, you know, and how close they can be. And these energies were calculated at density functional theory level, you know, and just a few tens of MeVs give you so many structures. So imagine if your error is more than a few tens of MeVs, can you trust all of these structures? You know, so that's a good question to ask, you know, and, uh, so that's why, I mean, we spent so long to identify a good functional in this case, right? And okay, once we have the functional though, we still have to navigate through this giant configurational space. And I won't go into the details here because Chris is gonna talk about all of this. And I don't know, maybe he will discuss this particular one as well. But uh, the idea is really to perform this random structure search calculations where you randomly shove in atoms in this unit cell and you optimize them. And if you repeat this process many times, based on some empirical knowledge about how potential energy surfaces are shaped, you can show that you would actually eventually get all of these structures. So we were able to now with the machine learning potential perform these simulations. And at least I was able to run all of them on the same desktop on which I'm presenting this on Zoom. And all I did was that ran a giant script on bash uh, because that's what uh, Chris's code is is uh, based on, and next morning I had all of these structures. Of course, it I had to do some processing, but I managed to recover everything uh, that was known in first principle literature in uh, overnight, basically. And what I also found was a new phase, which is this flat rhombic phase. So this is different from the force field rhombic phases or the previously known density functional rhombic phases, uh, which were buckled actually. And we also showed that actually when you run finite temperature MD, many of these DFT phases, you know, will be dynamically unstable, you know? So the flat rhombic phase was a good addition to our known set. So anyway, long story short, we combined a random structure search with a machine learning potential and we found most of the relevant phases and we are rather sure that we have sampled the configurational space exhaustively in this case, right? Now the last bit is really on understanding phase transition. Now we've done all the hard yards, you know, of identifying the functional, finding all the phases. Now it's time to simulate all of these phases and make sure we get the melting temperatures and transition temperatures right. And this is something which is which was of interest, of course, to me since my PhD on predicting relative stabilities. And if you predict relative stabilities at all temperatures and pressures, you get your phase diagram essentially, right? So this is where I was coming from, and this is how I wanted to approach this problem which is to combine a good quality potential energy surface, you know, with a good enough method, which would include sampling of your uh, potential energy surface. So in this case, I was going to combine molecular dynamics and path integral molecular dynamics, you know, on the machine learning potential surface, which we had carefully chosen. And with that, our hope was that we have eliminated most of the uh, sources of error. In fact, on the sampling side, there are no sources of error. The only ones are on the surface and we hope that our predictions will be rock solid now. So the approach that we used was thermodynamic integration. Again, uh, something that I enjoyed working on during my PhD where you perform these alchemical paths, you know, between two points. So generally, you know, if you take a harmonic approximation, you can easily obtain the free energy of your system. You know, if you can define a reversible path and this is really a fictitious path, you cannot have this in nature where where the system actually on one end of the path has a harmonic potential and on the other end, it has an anharmonic potential, you know? And the way to do that is by your path will depend on Lambda and this Lambda will smoothly change your potential energy surface from one to the other, you know? Again, it's a bit abstract, but the idea is that if you perform this kind of a thing, then by just calculating uh, the difference between the harmonic and anharmonic energies at various values of this Lambda, you can get the anharmonic free energy. And again, you can do something similar at the quantum mechanical level while including the fact that all your nuclei are quantum particles and they have zero point energies. And the actual kinetic energy of your system is different from the classical kinetic energy. And with this, you can actually get your rigorous free energy, which includes both anharmonicity as well as the fact that your nuclei are quantum. Uh, now, the way to compute the phase diagrams was to do it separately for the solid solid phases and the solid liquid phases. So this is how I uh, I, I, I appro approached it. Uh, 
let's say you run a set of simulations uh, for crystal one and crystal two, which are two possible phases. This could be hexagonal, this could be pentagonal. At some point, of course, the temperature would be high enough that this crystal would melt, right? And that would give you, let's say, a region of metastability of the phases, you know. Now in this part, you know that crystal one is definitely more stable. So you know that this is the most dominant phase. And in this part, crystal two. But in this part, either of them could be, you know, because they are both metastable. So the way to uh, perform, uh, to get the free energies of your system at this temperature and pressure is to perform a thermodynamic integration over temperature. And what this tells you is that if you run a series of simulations, you know, from a low temperature to a high temperature, and you perform a harmonic approximation at the low temperature, then the temperature dependent enthalpy can relate, uh, the integral of the enthalpy can actually give you a term that depends on the Gibbs free energy. So if you use this formula, where the enthalpy can also be computed with quantum nuclear effects, you will get your Gibbs free energy. And after that, all you have to do is for the two phases, compare the Gibbs free energy as a function of temperature. And at some point, one of these phases you will see will become more stable than the others. You know. In this case, I'm just showing that early on the red phase, you know, crystal two was more stable, but after that crystal one became more stable. But at this point, they both have exactly the same Gibbs free energies. And that is the transition point, you know? So on your temperature axis, what you can do is you can, sorry, uh, for this given pressure on your temperature axis, you can mark exactly the point, you know, where the two phases have the same free energy. And then you can repeat that at another pressure, you know, and do exactly the same thing, you know. You recompute your Gibbs free energies as a function of temp, temp temperature and find the pressure at which both of them are the same, you know, and that becomes your other point. And if you do this multiple times and keep joining these lines, you know, that gives you your phase boundary, you know. So you have to perform uh, a grid of calculations at different temperatures and different pressures, you know. And by all of that uh, knowledge, uh, by using this formula to compute the Gibbs free energy as a function of pressure and temperature. And by just comparing the free energies of different phases, you can chart out its phase diagram. Is this clear to everyone? Yeah. All right. I, yeah, sorry. No, it sounds good. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, yes, so, and what about the solid to liquid? Is there a question? I think I'm just hearing my echo and think <laughs> at this point. All right, so for the solid to liquid phase transitions, uh, we don't use this approach because if you take, if you perform this temperature integral low to high up to the point where something melts, you know, it will not be a reversible path because when you reduce your temperature, the liquid may actually, let's say remain, a, remain disordered for a while longer due to hysteresis, right? Yeah. Or a solid may actually become a liquid later on, you know, due to over, what is it called? Uh, overheating or something like that, yeah. So this is not a reversible path for the for the liquid. So we have to use a different approach. And I use an approach which was, let's say, state of the art from a while ago, which is direct coexistence simulation. The simplest simulation, which doesn't require any order parameters. The idea is that you choose a pressure, you simulate the coexistence of two phases. So you take half of a solid and half of a liquid with a stable interface and you simulate the same system at different temperatures. At low temperatures, the entire system will freeze. At high temperatures, uh, the entire system will liquefy. But at a given temperature, uh, all temperatures below this will lead to freezing and all temperatures above that will lead to melting. You know, And that temperature will be your melting temperature. So this is again, one of these simulations where you need to perform these half liquid, half solid, uh, supercell calculations or supercell simulations at different uh, at for at, at different temperatures and keep identifying these points where the interface is actually stable, which means that neither the liquid is converting to a solid nor the solid is converting to a liquid. You know, and when you do that, you get your crystal liquid phase boundary. You know, and once you do that for all the combinations of phases, you know, it is not as difficult as it sounds. You know, if you get into the groove, you know. You can really finish it quite rather quickly if you have all the data. You know? Yeah. And that gives you both the solid solid and the solid liquid phase boundaries. Okay. So, and with that, we have addressed all of our challenges, you know, and, uh, and e for each of these, and again, I mean, before I get to the results, I want to again show the slide on the literature review that this is actually extremely important because you always need to know where the community is, you know, and of course, 
understanding where your entire field of physics chemistry or material sciences requires you to understand research discipline level or literature so really uh, we are talking about papers which appeal to general physicists and chemists you know so so called higher impact journals which appeal to uh, higher audiences would be the ones that you may want to be reading or you may want to be reading a, let's say something like the economist even you know where some things might be discussed here or you may want to be going to conferences you know during a phd where where we are talking about big conferences rather than workshops you know just to understand what are all the problems that people are working on and why similarly within a research problem you may want to uh, go and attend some workshops you know where for example if there is a workshop on a uh, solid liquid interfaces you know there you will discuss a lot of open challenges in this area and hopefully some experimentalists will also be around you know and for research methodologies you need very specific things like summer schools or in some cases you need to attend uh, tutorials and so on at least in computational hemisphere these tutorials are really the one where you really get into the nitty gritty of the field you know but overall having a good knowledge of how things are of, of what research is being done in various or uh, tiers of research you know really gives you a good understanding of what kind of problems you could work on and the kind of problems that can potentially be solved during your phd and using the techniques that you know or the techniques that exist because if you decide to solve to develop the theory of everything during your phd then uh, that might end up taking longer than what or what you would like you know all right so this is the problem that we wanted to work on uh, we did everything that we could to identify the tools that we could use you know and eventually our we used a four step approach to get to the final phase diagram you know and the first step we did was to do quantum monte carlo calculations to select a density functional and the reason we did that was to get uh, some benchmark numbers on what are the ground truth energies just to help us understand in the absence of experiments you know what kind of potential energy surfaces should we be selecting in this case if you don't have access to qmc or rpa uh, but if you have experimental data then it makes sense to compare your dft predictions you know with the experiments and that will again solve the same purpose but you need to be make sure you are comparing correctly the right temperatures right pressures or you are subtracting these contributions from the experiment and so on and the next bit is on machine learning potentials for density functional theory so once we identified the functional to make sure we can rapidly predict energies and forces uh, we developed one you know and that was uh, extremely useful for the next bits because we were able to really perform the random structure search very quickly as well as use this potential for pre energy calculations and simulations where you could see that we needed to really perform simulations at every temperature and pressure as well as solid liquid uh, interface simulation which were as long as 20 nanoseconds for each point you know so this comes in handy uh, and of course i mean this, all of these really allows us to understand the phase behavior of a system at all temperatures and pressures of course this is our workflow and at least the reason why i find this uh, workflow important is because we really address things which are of use to map you know our system to an observable which is the fact that we make sure we are accurate you know we make sure we are efficient because efficiency and accuracy are often correlated the level of accuracy in which up to which you can go depends on how good your code is you know and okay that's my echo so and finally uh, the third thing that we understood was exhaustive whether we have really thoroughly investigated our problem statement in our case this was more about phases in your case it could be something else you know so again the exhaustivity also depends on efficiency you know so all of these are correlated and finally the kind of physics we are able to add you know to our modeling while we treat nuclear motion that is uh, makes our predictions rigorous so in that case since this is rigorous exhaustive the only source of error now in our calculation is the potential energy surface you know so if we agree with the experiment we can say that this functional is actually good and if we disagree with the experiment we can say that well perhaps we need to improve our functional or perhaps there was something missing in the interpretation of the experiments if we are really sure about our functional so in other words we can really have predictive simulations you know uh, with with this kind of an approach you know so again i don't need to get into all of this now i mean where the individual steps right. because i discussed it in good amount of detail but if anybody has a has a question up to this point on this then i'm happy to uh, pause for a bit before i get to the results
yeah, I think we all want to finish this talk, you know, and move on with our lives. So let's do that, you know. Okay, so let's see what kind of phase diagram we see. So it's important. I mean, I'm not going to show you the full phase diagram to make it easier to uh, to uh, to discuss parts of it. Uh, so at low temperatures, essentially, which is less than around room temperature, you see that you have something relatable to the phase diagram of water, which is that you have a hexagonal phase, you know, except that this is a 2D hexagonal phase, you know, and then as uh, the MW model had predicted, you know, we have a pentagonal phase here. And again, this was also in agreement with the density functional theory calculations, right? Now, this is where we start seeing differences where previous calculations had shown either a square phase to be stable or a buckle rhombic phase to be stable, you know? We found that the buckle rhombic phase was not even dynamically stable, so it destabilizes immediately. And while the square phase was not more uh, stable than the rhombic phase, so our prediction here really is that uh, beyond, let's say, one GPA, you should most likely be seeing either a square phase to a few pressures, but after that, it will predominantly become rhombic. And we know we can be confident about this only because we have performed QMC calculations whenever we were in doubt. Now, the other interesting bits that you can analyze from this are the slopes of these lines. These slopes tell, tell you whether a solid expands upon freezing or it doesn't. And again, actually 2D ice also expands upon freezing. It expands half the amount as 3D ice, but it makes you wonder why exactly, what is with this hexagonal phase and expansion of ice? You know? All right, so this was the solid part of the phase diagram, which we have met managed to clarify with this, you know. Now to get to the liquid part and to see solid liquid phase transition, uh, things really get very interesting here. So what we find is that uh, based on uh, what Stan, Eugene Stanley's people had predicted with force fields, you know, there are parts of the phase diagram where you have solid, solid phase transitions, uh, sorry, where you have first order phase transitions, but then there are also parts with continuous phase transitions which are with these dotted lines, but differently from the force field predictions, these are not solid to liquid phase transitions. What we found was that there is actually a new phase which is called a hexatic phase. And in 2D physics, a hexatic phase is something between a solid and a liquid. Just like in 3D, a liquid phase is something between a solid and a gas, you know, solid doesn't move, a gas moves, liquid is, well, you know, how do you define a liquid? Maybe somebody can help me, but basically that's what it is, you know. Uh, in 2D cases, you have this hexatic phase, which bears uh, features of both the solid and a liquid. And actually that changes re reversibly into a liquid phase. And again, this is actually part of a much bigger uh, uh, theory here, which is the KT, H, and Y theory in 2D physics, which dictates that any short range potential in 2D will undergo a two-step melting mechanism where either of the steps can be continuous phase transitions. And in this case, we find for our quasi 2D system, we have a first order solid to liquid and a second order, sorry, first order solid to hexatic and a second order hexatic to liquid phase transition. So what we have really found here agrees with the theories which were written on a piece of paper in the 1970s, for example. So that's extremely, that was very interesting, you know. So again, just to look at how these phase transitions actually change the properties of a system. At low pressures where you have a first order phase transition, we see the expected results of a, dis uh, a discontinuous change in your potential energy and in your diffusion coefficient. So your system immediately starts flowing after the phase transition. And on the other hand, at one GPA, we see that there is a discontinuous change into this hexatic phase, which doesn't flow. So it's not a liquid. you know. But then uh, as you increase the uh, temperature, it reversibly changes to a liquid phase, you know? And uh, this is what this phase looks like. Uh, okay, it seems like you are not able to see the video here, but what I, are you? I don't think so, right? Uh, yes, okay. Mm. okay, now you're probably you're able to see it. Yes. Yeah, so as you can see that it bears similarities with both solids and liquids. It doesn't flow, but all the water molecules rotate here. So it's a disordered system, but it's not a liquid here, you know, and you can actually study it in a more rigorous way. Sorry. 
Okay. okay. We can study it in a more rigorous way by looking yeah. at uh, the structure oh. factor and the radial distribution functions. And by looking for six fold symmetry because the hexatic phase actually contains six fold symmetry in real space as well as in reciprocal space. You know? And uh, as soon as you start increasing the temp temperature, so red here means uh, mm -hmm. an oxygen atom and red here means the probability of finding an oxygen atom at a distance. And you can see that there's a six fold symmetry here. But as you increase the temperature, you lose the six fold symmetry and you get a pure liquid, which is completely isotropic here. And this is these are exactly the structure factors that you would predict for hard spheres and so on, you know, for 2D systems. So it really shows that we are seeing something very similar to the KTHNY theory of uh, KTHNY type phase transitions. You know. And the other thing that we find is the extent of dissociation in 2D, which is of more relevance maybe in chemistry or for transport properties. So here we have a probe, which basically gives us an estimate of the number of OH bonds that could dissociate in 100 picoseconds. And this is just a number that we have used for us to visualize things. So on this time scale, uh, bulk ice does not dissociate. You know, So you have a zero uh, here. And in this, uh, temperature and pressure, ice will form your I7 phase. However, as soon as you study a monolayer of water, you start seeing large amounts of a dissociation, you know? And that makes you think that actually maybe 2D water has a higher propensity of dissociation than 3D, you know? The other thing that we found was that for GPA, we have extremely large, uh, extremely large uh, uh, propensities. I, I mean, within a few hundreds of picoseconds, pretty much all the water molecules are dissociating here, you know, which means that there is a lot of proton transfer. And this reminded us of the fact that bulk water has a super ionic phase, but that is only stable at very high temperatures and pressures. So we wondered whether we are seeing this particular phase at accessible temperatures and pressures. And indeed by calculating these ionic conductivities, which were only possible because we had a machine learning potential because these are each of these points are 20 nanoseconds long. So extremely tedious simulations. You are able to get an ionic conductivity greater than this 0.1 cm per centimeter, which is the cutoff for a super ionic uh, material. You know, and for you to see what this looks like, uh, in blue you see the instantaneous defects uh, or proton defects that form. You know, you can see that a lot of uh, uh, hydrogen are being exchanged and being stabilized between water molecules. Now we are going to go for a fast forward of 20 nanoseconds without hydrogens, but we will just do a snapshot or we'll just follow a few hydrogen atoms. And you can see that all of these are actually doing some sort of a random walk in, uh, in between the oxygen molecule of, or in between the oxygen atoms. So your oxygens are essentially fixed in your lattice position, but the protons are flowing through them, you know, and that is exactly uh, how a 3D superionic phase looks like, or at least this is how it's this described. And we were able to find this phase, you know, at much more accessible conditions. So again, I mean, this is where I think things are going to end now. Uh, so the key findings and outlooks of this project, at least the scientific ones was that uh, by really making sure that we focus on different aspects of the modeling, so making sure we have good accuracy, uh, good efficiency, and uh, by making sure we really combine our potential energy surface with a good sampling approach, which includes all the physics, we actually find extremely interesting results for this seemingly system, sim, sim, simplistic system. The other nice thing was that we found a lot of features which were known before from force fields. So it also shows maybe certain force fields are accurate in some parts of the phase diagram, but none of these force fields are able to describe the full thing, you know? So that, so this kind of a comprehensive study also clarifies the situation, you know, all of the things that I had done, uh, studied during my literature review, I was able to get a clear answer to most of them, you know? So that was extremely nice. And then finally, we see some very interesting phases, which are probably uh, of relevance, you know, uh, in natural sciences, for example, in physics, this hexatic phase would be extremely interesting. And similarly in engineering, perhaps the super ionic phase could be extremely interesting you know? because perhaps something like this could be used for battery materials. All right, so again, I mean, this talk was more to give you some sort of a guidance on scientific problems, how to approach things, how to use the methods that are accessible to you and so on.
I hope it was all right uh, because of course Angulos was supposed to speak and uh, he's not well, so I had to uh, compile these slides uh, in 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 a couple of days. So I hope this was helpful for you. But the idea really is that you will be in a situation where you'll have to make a lot of choices of functionals or sampling approaches. You may have to find a lot of uh, observables and make sure you compare with experiments. While you're writing your papers, draw strong conclusions to approach the scientific problems. And all of these technical things are just as important as things like really making sure you think about what problems are important in your research area, talking to people in your community, making sure you have a good understanding of what other people are working on and having a good idea of literature, what other groups are working on, what are the cutting edge areas in your field, what are the best methods available and which are the ones that you can use. And it always helps to have a strong network, knowing people. For example, in my case, I really uh, managed to do all of this because I had the help from Andrea Zen and Christoph who were respective experts in uh, machine learning potential and uh, in quantum Monte Carlo. So basically just knowing people around you, making sure that you are working on the important problems can actually pay dividends. And it can really allow you to make sure that all the results that you have, because you know the literature, you can really put things in perspective and understand whether this has really advanced the field or not. Okay, so this was basically enough psychobabble for, from me for two hours. Thanks a lot. And I hope this was interesting. If you have any questions, uh, happy to. Yes, Kit, go on. Um, I'm just curious as to um, how, when you're using machine learning potential, how could you show, or if it's not working, how could you show that it is because of the model as such? So the limitations of the model, how could I show that the reason that I can't learn something would be that not, let's say, lack of training data or um hmm. yeah i don't know like yeah so that's a good question and that's very much a uh let's say a machine learning sort of a question and uh so let's see if i have a yeah so basically what you're saying how do you know if you're trying to learn something whether it's a problem of the model and not the training data right yeah right so in that case if it really is a problem of your model you should you should try to look at your learning curves you know and the learning curve is basically a curve like this where you predict your test and training er error you know? yeah or error as a function of amount of data that you add in you know and if your model starts saturating about after a certain point you know that means that the model doesn't have enough flexibility to learn anything you know and at that point it is really a problem of your uh, of your uh, of your model you know however if you have a situation where both your where your training error keeps reducing with your data you know yeah. however your validation error saturates yeah. or starts increasing Wait, that sorry, means can you I, don't can sorry? I interrupt quickly uh, uh, validation is yeah. so there's there's your training data which is what the machine literally trains on that's yeah. split then into well let's say train and is that validation or is that Test. Yeah. So validation, validation is yeah. So initially you split your data into a test set and a training set, and then you further split your training set into a training set and a validation set. Okay. And so yeah. would that up there be an example of overfitting? Yeah. So because what you're really seeing is that your model can learn no matter what you uh, provide it, you know. So the error can still reduce. But when you generalize it, you know, it's a problem, which means that the model is either so there are two possibilities here either you can uh, use something called a regularization term which makes sure that your model doesn't fluctuate too much and try to fit to everything you know uh, or you can add more data you know okay so, and so long story you... short you need to check whether you're overfitting or not if you are overfitting you need more data if you are not overfitting then you need a better model you know? okay thank you all right Any other question? Yeah, please. Yeah. 
Hello, uh, Bekant. Uh, very interesting. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, just mm -hmm. a good uh, question about your Facebook. I noticed mm -hmm. that uh, in the face boundaries, uh, so in some on some face boundaries, there are both horizontal and uh, vertical arabas, mm -hmm. but on some there are just horizontal um, arabas. Yeah. I'm wondering how do you evaluate mm -hmm. the errors? Yeah, between two different faces because uh, according to my understanding, um, mm -hmm. the relative stability is determined on Gibbs free energy, and the boundary should be very, um, you know, specific mm -hmm. and exact. Right. Yeah, that's a that's actually a very good point, you know, and it would be, you know, if uh, maybe I can again use, you know, a drawing. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, yeah, so let's say, so my Gibbs free energies will have some error bars, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, so let's say this is how my first phase changes, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and let's say this is how my second phase. Okay, now if you were to, because what does this error bar really mean? It means that actually uh, the average, mm -hmm. if you perform these uh, calculate, if you perform this prediction many times, mm -hmm. then instead mm -hmm. of one prediction, you have a probability distribution, a Gaussian, right? And the mean of this Gaussian is the mean of your, is, is, is the average that you would get if you draw, let's say uh, uh, an infinite number of samples. But uh, if you have finite number of them, then uh, you have some sort of an error bar. So, so another way of thinking about this is that if you try to interpolate, you know, these lines, you know, then you can also yeah. interpolate yeah. what would be the error bar ac actually. Yeah. You know? yeah. And if you do that, you might get a curve like yeah. this, you know, if you include the error bars, you know. And that immediately says that instead of a one, instead of one point, you actually have a region, you know, of phase bound where your two phases can be stable. Do you see my point? Yeah. So the Gibbs free energy overlaps at uh, that exactly. Region. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Any other question? If not, we will just stare at each other for the next two minutes until it's 3 p.m. So to make this not awkward, maybe ask, you know. Sorry? And it was just someone outside talking. Uh, okay, okay. All right, I think that's a cue that Perhaps we can save one minute of our life and do something more interesting, you know? Uh, and yes, so thanks a lot for coming. I really hope this was uh, useful for you all, you know? I would very much appreciate some sort of feedback on this, whether this was useful or if something was not useful, maybe you could tell me that as well, so that if I have been, if I have to present something like this again, I can actually talk about things which are useful during a PhD. All right. Uh, have a nice rest of the afternoon to everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks, Venkat. Was great. Yeah, great stuff as always. Thanks, all right. all. Thank okay. you. Yeah, thanks. Ciao. Cheers.